Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to lecture 17 of the course on multivariate data mining methods and applications. The title of this lecture is kernel principal component analysis. Now, if the hidden feature space of the multivariate data is linear, then for the dimensionality reduction we can use the classical principal component analysis. In the last lecture, we have discussed uh, several examples where the hidden feature space is nonlinear. And uh, in that case, you cannot use the linear principal component analysis. The results obtained from uh, linear principal component analysis are not so reliable. So, in that case uh, one can go for some non-linear methods like uh, polynomial based principal component analysis. Now, one of the option is we can make use of kernel trick. In the last lecture, we have used a kernel trick for estimating the probability density function of a given set of observations. One can use such kind of kernel trick to capture the non-linear hidden structure of the multivariate data also. So, in this lecture, our focus is on using the kernel based procedures for principal component analysis, so that we can capture the hidden non-linear structure of the data. So, the basic objective of kernel principal component analysis is to unveil non-linear structures. There is non-linear structure present in the data and you have to identify, you have to capture that nonlinear structure and for that purpose we use kernel principal component analysis. The traditional principal component analysis is a powerful tool for dimensionality reduction, but we can use it just when the hidden structure of the data is linear and it struggles with non-linear data. If the data are concentrated around some non-linear feature space, then the linear principal component analysis or the tra traditional principal component analysis fails to provide appropriate results. Then uh, in kernel principal component analysis actually we extend the classical principal component analysis to capture non-linear relationships using kernel tricks. So, we make use of kernel tricks. Our objective is to capture non-linear relationships. The procedure is actually based on the classical principal component analysis it is just an extension of the classical principal component analysis. Now, what is kernel function? Kernel function maps input data to a high dimensional feature space. So, first what we do? We map the input data to a high dimensional feature space and uh, using this kernel trick or kernel function we are able to capture the complex hidden structure of the data. 
So, the kernel PCA identifies non-linear structures by projecting data into this feature space. So, first what we do? We map the input data to a high dimensional feature space using kernel trick and then we identify the non-linear structure by projecting the data into this feature space and it also enables efficient analysis of data with non-linear structures. You can analyze the data which have non-linear structure. There are various applications of kernel PCA say in financial time series analysis financial data often exhibit non-linear relationships and uh, then financial data also show very complex patterns. To identify such kind of complex patterns one can make use of kernel PCA and kernel PCA is able to uncover hidden structures and extract relevant features for forecasting purposes. Basically, uh, the main objective of uh, is studying several financial time series is uh, forecasting. So, once you uncover this hidden structures which is quite complex, then you can extract the relevant features which are useful for forecasting purpose and then you can make forecasts. For instance, analyzing stock price data. So, stock price movements are the quite complicated. So, you can make use of kernel PCA to identify latent factors driving market trends. Which latent factors are driving the market trends? And once you identify these latent factors, it becomes easier for you to capture the stock price movements. Then you can make appropriate forecast, more accurate forecasts. Image recognition. Kernel PCA can capture non-linear relationships in image features. For example, in recognizing handwritten digits using kernel PCA to extract non-linear features for classification. Say somebody has written 4 in this way or 4 in this way in this way etcetera. So, basically what you have to do? You have to recognize these hand written digits and then you can make use of kernel PCA and uh, you have to identify the non-linear feature hidden in this hand written full and once you identify the non-linear features, you can recognize the handwriting. In genomics, genomic data also exhibit complex non-linear relationships. Often the relationships are not so simple, so quite complex. And uh, often some non-linear hidden structure is there and your objective is to identify that non-linear hidden structure. Say for instance, uh, the relationships between genes and phenotypes. So, kernel PCA can capture hidden structures in genomic data or your objective may be to identify the genetic markers which are associated with a particular disease. 
For that purpose also you can make use of kernel principal component analysis on gene expression data. Further in neuroscience, the brain activity data is high dimensional and it also has very complex non-linear relationships. Then you can make use of kernel PCA to identify or to explore the underlying structures in neural data. And once you identify the hidden structure, hidden complex structure of the data, you can easily understand the brain dynamics. For example, for analyzing fMRI data or CT scan data, you can make use of kernel PCA. So, one can apply kernel PCA in various domains, say so, neuroscience in uh, analyzing the MRI data or the CT scan data. So, you can apply all these techniques in different fields. Even in chemo informatics also, say chemical data often has non-linear relationships between molecular properties. And then to identify those non-linear relationships, you can use kernel principal component analysis. So, suppose you want to extract meaningful features for the, the purpose of molecular classification, then you can make use of kernel PCA. Then the kernel PCA also helps you in predicting various properties of the chemicals like toxicity or solubility on chemical fingerprints. So, you, one can apply kernel, pro, kernel PCA in various fields. Now, we come to the method of kernel principal component analysis. Suppose x i belongs to r r, i equal to 1 to n is your input vector. So, obviously, x i is of order r cross 1. Then what we do? We take a non-linear transformation of input vector x i into a point phi x i in n h dimensional feature space. n h is uh, quite large. So, the non-linear transformation of the input vector is from r r which is r dimensional to a space which is n h dimensional and then phi x i is equal to phi 1 x i phi 2 x i so on phi n h x i and this belongs to say h. So, phi x i is n h cross 1 and then i takes values from 1 to n. This mapping phi is called the feature mapping and given phi x 1, phi x 2, so on phi x n belonging to h with summation of phi x i equal to 0. We assume that phi x i is already centered, so that summation phi x i is equal to 0. Then we solve a linear PCA problem in feature space h. Obviously, this has a higher dimensionality than that of the input space that is n h is greater than r. 
So, again I repeat we make this transformation from the input vector to phi x i in n h dimensional feature space and then we get the feature mapping and then on these phi's we apply simple linear PCA. Now, PCA in feature space, the estimated covariance matrix of feature space is say c equal to 1 upon n summation i equal to 1 to n phi x i phi x i transpose. So, just uh, instead of x size, we are taking phi x size and uh, assuming that these phi x size are already centered c equal to 1 upon n summation phi x i phi x i transpose is the estimated covariance matrix in the feature space. Then you have to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of c. This is the covariance matrix in feature space or estimated covariance matrix in the feature space and then you have to find its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. The Eigen equation is C v equal to lambda v, just like the traditional principal component analysis. V is the Eigen vector corresponding to Eigen value lambda. Now, we pre multiply equation 1 by phi x i transpose and then we obtain phi x i transpose C v equal to lambda phi x i transpose v, we get this equation. And in fact, uh, the left hand side is the inner product of phi x i and C v and the right hand side is lambda times the inner product of phi x i and v, where the inner product is defined as inner product for two vectors psi 1 and psi 2 is psi 1 transpose psi 2. Further L 2 norm or the square of L 2 norm of psi is the inner product of psi and psi. So, from here we observe that V equal to say summation i equal to 1 to n alpha i phi x i which is a linear function of x i just like in the uh, traditional principal component analysis, your Eigen vector is a linear function of columns of x matrix. Here also this Eigen vector v is a linear function of phi x size. Then we define n cross n matrix say kappa equal to kappa i j, where kappa i j is equal to phi x i transpose phi x j. So, now we are using the kernel trick. Again notice that the form of the function phi is unknown. So, we use uh, the kernel trick in this manner we take kappa i j equal to phi x i transpose phi x j and then we define this n cross n matrix kappa equal to the i j th element of kappa is kappa i j. Kappa will generally be a huge matrix. Then you can write the Eigen equation as summation j summation l kappa i j kappa j l alpha l equal to n lambda summation l equal to 1 to n alpha l kappa i l for all i. To show this result, say you have phi x i transpose c v equal to lambda phi x i transpose v and then the expression for c is 1 upon n summation over j phi x j phi x j transpose and 
then V is equal to summation L equal to 1 to n alpha L phi x L and kappa i j is equal to phi x i transpose phi x j. So, you can write this equation as you substitute the value of c v and uh, then on the right hand side also we substitute the value of v from here. So, we obtain phi x i transpose we substitute this value of c and then we take this n towards the right hand side. So, you have summation over j phi x i phi x j transpose then you have summation over l alpha l phi x l which is equal to n times lambda phi x i transpose summation over l alpha l phi x l. So, this is the right hand side. Now, you can take phi x i transpose inside this summation and then you take the entire quantity inside this summation. So, you get summation over j summation over l phi x i transpose phi x j. Now, phi x i transpose phi x j is equal to kappa i j. So, you get kappa i j here and then you have phi x j transpose phi x l which is equal to kappa j l you get kappa j l here and alpha l here. So, summation over j summation over l kappa i j kappa j l alpha l equal to n times alpha summation over l alpha l then phi x i transpose phi x l is equal to kappa i l. So, you get this equation for all i and then we combine all these equations for all i and we write the equations in matrix form. In fact, we obtain kappa square alpha equal to n times lambda kappa alpha. This is kappa alpha and uh, this is kappa square alpha or this is actually i lth element of kappa square alpha and uh, this one is the i lth element of kappa alpha. Alpha is equal to alpha 1 so on alpha n or you can write it as kappa alpha equal to lambda curl alpha where lambda curl is equal to n times lambda. So, you can write this equation in this form. Further lambda 1 curl, lambda 2 curl, so on lambda n curl, these are the ordered eigenvalues of kappa and the corresponding eigenvectors are alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha n. So, these are the corresponding eigenvectors lambda curl alpha can be expressed in terms of lambda v. So, what is lambda curl? Lambda curl is equal to n times lambda. Similarly, you can write alpha in terms of v. Now, if the inner product of v i v i is equal to 1 that is v i transpose v i is equal to 1 then using this relationship between v's and alphas we obtain 1 equal to summation j equal to 1 to n summation k equal to 1 to n alpha i j alpha i k into the inner product of phi x j phi x k and then this is equal to summation j equal to 1 to n k equal to 1 to n alpha i j alpha i k kappa j k. 
and this is equal to the inner product of alpha i and kappa alpha i. And the inner product of alpha i kappa alpha i gives you lambda i curl the inner product of alpha i alpha i. So, lambda i curl alpha i alpha i the inner product of alpha i alpha i is equal to 1. And this is actually the normalization for the vectors alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha n. So, you have this kind of normalization condition. Now, suppose x is a test point, then the nonlinear principal component scores of x corresponding to this function phi are given by the projection of phi belonging to h onto the eigenvectors v k belonging to h. And uh, you have v k phi the inner product of v k phi equal to lambda k to the power minus half summation i equal to 1 to n alpha k i the inner product of phi x k phi x for all k equal to 1 to n. We have included this term lambda k to the power minus half here, so that the inner product of v k v k is equal to 1. Now, if we make use of the causal trick, then the non-linear principal component scores of x can be expressed as Notice that uh, this function phi is uh, unknown and uh, then you have to make use of the kernel trick. So, v k phi x is equal to lambda k to the power minus half. You make use of this expression, then phi x k transpose phi x which is the inner product of phi x k and phi x is equal to kappa x i x for all k equal to 1 to n. Now, suppose x is equal to x n, then we have say v k phi x equal to lambda k to the power minus half summation i equal to 1 to n alpha k i kappa i m. You are replacing this x by x m. So, you get kappa i m here which is equal to lambda k to the power minus half this matrix kappa alpha k and then the mth component of this again this is equal to lambda k to the power minus half kappa alpha k is equal to lambda k alpha k. So, the mth component of kappa alpha k is equal to lambda k alpha k then the mth element of kappa alpha k is the mth element of lambda k alpha k and this is actually proportional to alpha k m. The mth element of alpha k. Notice that this uh, lambda k is a scalar. So, what you get here lambda k to the power minus half into lambda k. So, you get lambda k to the power half here and ultimately the element is proportional to alpha k m. So, now we discuss different advantages of kernel principal component analysis. Say the first advantage is it can capture non-linear patterns in data. 
or non-linear hidden structures in the data without making any assumptions about the function phi. Of course, in the derivation part we have used function phi and then ultimately we have used the kernel trick. So, that uh, even if the function phi is unknown we can make use of kernel PCA robustness. Uh, the kernel PCA is usually more robust to outliers and noise in the data in comparison to the traditional principal component analysis uh, which is actually based on the simple linear projections. Versatility different types of kernel functions can be used to handle different types of data. So, this is the beauty of kernel PCA. You are not making any assumption about phi. So, you can handle different types of data or different types of data with different types of hidden structures. Like linear PCA, it can be used for data visualization, clustering and classification. So, it serves all these purposes also data visualization, clustering and classification. Uh, now, these are some kernel functions which one can use a Gaussian RBF kernel which is k x x dash equal to exponential minus sigma x minus x dash we take L to norm of this and square of this. Linear kernel k x x dash which is simply the inner product of x and x dash. We can make use of hyperbolic tangent kernel function k x x dash is tan hyperbolic scale then we take scale of inner product of x x dash. Then uh, you have Laplacian kernel also of this form or basal function can also be used as a kernel function. You can use polynomial kernel or spline kernel or ANOVA RBF kernel. So, there are uh, several kernel functions or several options which one can use. Now, we discuss the different challenges of kernel PCA. It is computationally expensive especially for the large data sets. Remember what we have done? We have transformed the orig original data to a large feature space and then it requires calculation of eigenvectors and eigenvalues of that data. And uh, when your original data is also of very high dimension or it is large data set, then such kind of transformation will make your transform data to be of very high dimensional. So, computationally uh, it is not so simple at least for the large data sets. It is computationally expensive. Then the selection of proper kernel function is a problem and the correct number of components and uh, these two require trial and error. You may try different kernel functions and then just look which kernel function is best suited for your problem. Then interpretation of results is not clear in the original feature space. Uh, means from the original feature space you are transforming the data and then you have transformed feature space and then you are applying the principal component analysis to the transformed feature space. But 
then translating your interpretations to the original feature space is not so simple. It is not suitable for data sets with many missing values of all outliers. So, if your data set has many missing values or it has many outliers, then it becomes difficult for you to apply kernel principal component analysis. Now, as an example, we again consider Irish data set and we apply kernel principal component analysis to Irish data set just for demonstration purpose. And then we have randomly sampled a test set of size 130 out of 150 observations. Then we have used these R packages kernel lab and uh, R lame tools. We have used Gaussian RBF kernel with sigma equal to 0 0.2. Of course, I have also given results for some other kernel functions also. Then uh, we have given biplot for the linear PCA and kernel PCA with Gaussian kernel. Now, these are the principal component vectors. Uh, of course, uh, it was not possible for me to give the entire set of principal component vectors but I have given here values for few selected values. The first principal component, the second principal component, then uh, this is corresponding to the first six observations and then the values corresponding to last 7 observations. Now, first we have plotted the data projection using linear PCA. So, this is linear PCA by plot. Uh, of course, uh, once you rotate the axis, then the dimension 1 captures around 73 percent of the variation, dimension 2 captures around 22.9 percent of variation. And then we have also applied the Gaussian kernel or and then we have performed kernel principal component analysis. Here in Gaussian kernel we have taken sigma equal to 0 0.2. The first principal component is taken on the x axis and the second principal component is taken on the y axis. So, this is the by plot. We have also considered the Gaussian kernel for sigma equal to 2.0 and for sigma equal to 2.0 of course, I have not given here different uh, uh, principal component vectors, but uh, just I am giving you the by plot again as earlier I have taken the first principal component on the x axis and second principal component on the y axis. So, you can draw by plot also using the kernel principal component analysis. Then this is the by plot corresponding to sigma equal to 5. So, you just observe how the by plot differs for different values of sigma. So, this is for sigma equal to 0 0.2, this is for sigma equal to 2.0. So, your kernel means the value of sigma has increased. So, the, your kernel is more wider. For sigma equal to 5, it is even more wider than sigma equal to 2. We have also taken the y plot for Laplacian kernel. And then you can compare the three kernels. 
So, this is for Gaussian kernel with sigma equal to 0 0.2, this is for sigma equal to 2.0 and this is for Laplacian kernel and these are the by plots. So, if you change your kernel function in the kernel principal component analysis, the by plots also change. So, you have to be careful while choosing the kernel function for your problem, which kernel function best suits your data. Now, in the last lecture, we have also discussed the kernel based method for estimating the probability density function on the basis of a given random sample or a given data set. So, here I have also taken an example in which we have drawn a random sample from the normal distribution, we have drawn a random sample of size 100 and then for the normal distribution the mean is taken as 10 and variance is 1. And then we have plotted the kernel density with different kernels. So, basically we know the distribution from which we have drawn the sample, but then we are estimating the probability density function using the kernel estimate. And for estimating the probability density function, just for the comparison purpose, we have used different kernel functions. So, this is the command in R, we have drawn a random sample from the normal distribution, then we have used the kernel based method for estimating the probability density function and then we have plotted the density functions. Now, this is the plot for the rectangular kernel. We have taken rectangular kernel and then we have estimated the density function. Here band width for each estimate or the for the estimates based on different kernel functions is taken as 0.3382. So, on the basis of rectangular kernel we get this plot of density estimate. If we use triangular kernel then we get this plot. Now, just by looking at these graphs what you observe? You observe that the estimate of density function based on the rectangular kernel is not so smooth. This one is not very smooth. Whereas, the estimate based on triangular kernel, this is quite smooth. At least it is much smoother than the estimated based on rectangular kernel. Uh, you also observe that mean of both the estimates is around 10. We have drawn the sample from a normal distribution with mean 10, but here mod is uh, slightly lower than 10 for this estimate, the estimate based on rectangular kernel. For the estimate based on triangular kernel, it is quite close to 10, the mode. In both the cases, the density function is quite symmetric, but it's still triangular kernel provides you a better estimate. Then we consider the kernel estimate based on Apache-Nikov kernel and bi-weighted kernel. Here also the estimate of 
probability density function is quite a smooth, but if you compare it with the kernel density estimate based on by weight kernel, this estimator based on by weighted kernel is more smooth and definitely it is closer to the parent dis distribution that is normal distribution with mean 10 and variance 1. Uh, here also we have taken the bandwidth as 0.3382. So, uh, when we draw sample or when we have random observations and on the basis of random observations, you have to estimate the density function, then different kernel functions may provide slightly different estimates of the probability density function. Again, you have to choose the kernel function wisely. So, when uh, uh, there is some kind of non-linear hidden structure present in your data, kernel principal component analysis provides a good option to handle such kind of data for reducing the dimensionality or for capturing the non-linear hidden structure without assuming any functional form for the hidden structure. You can make use of the kernel trick for this purpose. In this lecture, we have discussed how we can use the kernel trick for this purpose. Although there is a one problem with the kernel trick, if you have big data, very high dimensional data, then uh, what you do? We, you further transform it into a more higher dimensional feature space. So, resulting transformed feature space may be of very high dimension. So, it is computationally expensive you can say. Still in uh, most of the problems it works quite well. So, I am going to stop here. Thank you. Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. British humour does not have a very high standing in the world. When people talk about it, they usually do so with a certain degree of disparagement. Yet all this is, I think, rather unfortunate because if I read out to you a certain section from Jerome K. Jerome's famous novel Three Men in a Boat, you will realise that not only is British humour genuinely funny, it is probably even better than some of the other samples of humorous writings that you might have read in the recent past. The story that I am going to read out is told by Jerome, who thinks he is suffering from some kind of a malady. I remember going to the British Museum one day to read up the treatment <coughs> for some slight ailment of which I had a touch. <coughs> Hay fever, I fancy it was. I got down the book and read all I came to read and then in an unthinking moment I idly turned the leaves and began to indolently study diseases generally. 
I forgot which was the first distemper I plunged into. Some fearful, devastating scourge, I know. And before I had glanced half down the list of premonitory symptoms, it was borne in upon me that I had fairly got it. I sat for a while, frozen with horror, and then in the listlessness of despair, I again turned over the pages. I came to typhoid fever, read the symptoms, discovered that I had typhoid fever, must have had it for months without knowing it, wondered what else I had got, turned up St. Vitus's dance, found, as I expected, that I had that too. Began to get interested in my case and determined to sift it to the bottom and so started alphabetically. Read up ague and learned that I was sickening from it and that the acute stage would commence in about another fortnight. Bright's disease, I was uh, relieved to find, I had only in a modified form. And uh, so far as that was concerned, I might live for years. Cholera I had with uh, severe complications and uh, diphtheria I seemed to have been born with. I plodded conscientiously through the 26 letters and the only malady I could conclude I had not got was housemaid's knee. I felt rather hurt about this at first. It seemed somehow to be a sort of slight. Why hadn't I got housemaid's knee? Why this invidious reservation? After a while, however, less grasping feelings prevailed. I reflected that I had every other known malady in the pharmacology and I grew less selfish and determined to do without housemaid's knee. Gout in its most malignant stage, it would appear, had seized me without my being aware of it. And zymosis. I had zymosis evidently from boyhood. There were no more diseases after zymosis, uh, so I concluded there was nothing else the matter with me. I sat and pondered. I thought, what an interesting case I must be from a medical point of view. Uh, what an acquisition I should be to a class. Students would have no need to walk the hospitals if they had me. I was a hospital in myself. All they need to do would be to walk around me and, after that, take the diploma. Then I wondered how long I had to live. I tried to examine myself. I felt my pulse. Uh, I could not, at first, feel then, all of a sudden, it seemed to start off. I pulled out my watch and timed it. I made it a hundred... I tried to... I could not feel my heart. It had been beating, but now it had stopped been induced to come to the opinion that it must have been there all been beating, but I cannot account for it. All over my front, from what I call my... And uh, I went a bit around each side. But I could not feel... I uh, tried to look at my tongue as ever it would go and I shut one eye and tried 
I could only see the tip and the only thing that I had was to feel more certain than before that I had scarlet. I had walked into the reading room a happy health without a decrepit wreck. I visited a doctor and there he got a prescription to go for long walks and not to things he didn't understand. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippets. Now, uh, the discussion which I would make, uh, talk to you is about the and I am sure you will also reciprocate as I proceed and when you do the course, multivariate statistical problems and multivariate statistical analysis, multivariate. So, we know that statistics is a, is a subject where you try to analyze that using different type of technique, problem, MCMC techniques, then forecasting and, and then try to basically find out the best forecasting such that you are able to gain the maximum amount of information. Now, in the recent past, as we see statistics has 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 really increased in a manner and if I trace back to history it has been going on about 70, 80 years, but now the time has come very big way and the techniques which we all utilize with new vigor are in the area of say for example, in the area of factor analysis, in the area of conjoint analysis, in the area of multi dimension uh, scaling modeling, be it in the area of finance, be it in the area of sciences, be it in the area of economics, such that you are the information from the data in such a way that it really gives you some. Now, in the recent um, past, notion of large and complex data sets is also being a, a commensurate increase in techniques. So, obviously, the question comes that if the statistical call small data, not the big data, not the 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 data. And, and so on and so forth, where you use different type of computer obviously comes that are those statistical techniques really data sense. The question is they are not give you the best results. So, what we are seeing in years to excited about that is that how the new tools which we have already multivariate statistical analysis are being redrawn, remodeled in such a way that they can be utilized in a very nice manner that we are able to garner big data very successfully and very nicely that they are able to portray a sense of long to have from big data, be it in say for example, be it in weather forecasting, be it in transportation. So, means that students, participants who are in a position, background to take multivariate statistics and statistical tools in this program are assured are a very exciting future. Where to both gain the knowledge very best practical sense such that they are able to do some information which is given to them and get the best information 
I wish all the participants in this course the best of luck and I am sure to get the excitement which I have for this type of courses. Thank you.